Whether you're joining us across Australian Community TV as New Game Plus or Community Radio as Z Games, welcome to the show. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm in the RMIT studio with Meg. Hello. Hey. And uh, we're back for another field show. Uh, last week we spoke about, uh, well, we, we had a feature on the Working Lunch Next exhibit. That was pretty sick. It was amazing. Uh, Phoebe Watson talking about First Nations influence in Chaos Tavern and Cyberpunk Interview. And if you missed it, you can actually find that stuff on YouTube. Uh, YouTube.com slash New Game Plus TV. Correct. Um, Best channel ever. You'll see my interviews there too. It's pretty good. What a great interview. Yeah. Uh, speaking of interviews, we have a lot of interviews coming up this week. This episode's thick. Like, I'm really loving how much content we, we filmed at PAX and GCAP and Melbourne International Games Week. And this is another ripple effect of all that great, juicy content. It's insane. It's interviews galore. Yeah. So uh, coming up uh, very soon, we're going to be chatting with a developer from Bethesda working on Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, Kosh from Z Games in Brisbane did that one as well. Uh, I spoke with the Game Workers Unite team. So uh, some of these people are more deeply involved with Game Workers Unite than others. Perfect. But, I mean, a lot of people in game dev are really curious about what unions could do for the industry. It's a super important topic that we don't yeah. talk enough about. So um, we're going to be chatting with them a bit later on as well. And uh, last but certainly not least, I spoke with Matt Trobiani, uh, who ha it was not Matt Trobiani. That's something else. Uh, <laughs> Matt Trobiani is the developer. You probably would know him from Hacknet and Hacknet Labyrinths, but he's working on a new sports game. He went from the nerdiest game possible to being all about sports. Uh, hey, it's all about the journey and how you get there. I'm sure it was a great roll jump. Uh, Wrestle Dunk Sports, I believe, is the name of it. So he's going to be talking about that. that and the uh, highs and lows of game development because there are so Certainly, uh, a lot it's of very real. Jacob was full of that, but it's great that you actually got it on camera. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, good for some people, not so good for others. But uh, yeah, that's what's coming up in the episode. So let's get straight into it. Enjoy, guys. Koshi and Brendan here at PAX Australia. We're going to be interviewing Rich Lambert um, here from Bethesda. Um, he's going to be asking some questions, mostly about ESO and uh, kind of the surrounding platform regarding that. Sounds great. So tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what you do at ZeniMax. I am the creative director on ESO. Yep. So I've been working on it for 12 years now, <laughs> which is a very long time in the games industry. <laughs> yep. Uh, and you know, ESO is, is kind of my baby. You know, I love talking about it. I love um, watching people play and just learning about the game. And so, as part of the creative director mm -hmm. for that, uh, what do you show oversee pretty much everything regarding that? I am ultimately responsible for everything that goes into the game. The good and the bad. The good and the bad, <laughs> yes. Now, I don't do all of that myself. Obviously, I have a really talented team that does a lot of the, the heavy lifting on that stuff, but I manage all of the day-to-day -day and, and make sure that the things we're putting in the game meet certain standards and, and fit into the Elder Scrolls world. So with the recent release of the, um, the expansion for, um, for Elder Scrolls Online, how well has it been you know, received by uh, the, the fan base? It's, it's, uh, it's been amazing to see people uh, take to it. Uh, you know, dragons are obviously a huge draw. You know, it's yeah. something we wanted to have in, in Elder Scrolls for a very long time. But the, the new class, you know, the Necromancer is something that's been really, really positive. And then, uh, seeing people take to the Khajiit and learning more about the Khajiit, you know, they've only really been shown as kind of these, these bandits, you know, these, these traitors yeah. uh, in other Elder Scrolls games. And we were able to dig more into that culture and show kind of the spiritual side of them and kind of who they are and what they're all about. Cool. And more depth to the characters yeah. is always good. I'm guessing the online has just been asking them for, the, for them for a while. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm just extending from that, are there going to be any major, cha uh, major changes or improvements? Well, so uh, in the fourth quarter, we are releasing a story DLC called Dragon Hold. So that continues the, the season of the dragon. And it's actually the culmination of the season of the dragon, where uh, you're going to meet up with uh, members of the Dragon Guard and kind of put the band back together. And you're going to learn more about the Dragon Guard, who they are, what they're all about. And if you've completed the chapter and completed the story DLC, then it unlocks a series of quests that allows you to kind of put an end to the Season of the Dragon. And we've had recently, the Sony has kind of released a statement saying we've got cross-play, we've got everything available. How does that impact in the ESO world? That is a difficult thing. Yeah. You know, we've been working on the game for 12 years. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's something that we're looking at to seeing what we can and can't do, but we don't have any plans in the, in the near term, at least for that. Diving more into the, the lore, I guess, for ESO, and it's been this, as you said, the, the decade, you know, over a decade um, work on it. Um, is there any like untapped section that you really want to dive into, just, just personally, not necessarily in the, the grand <laughs> scheme of things? I mean, it's a huge world. Yeah. There's 
25 years worth of lore and stories oh, yeah. uh, in Elder Scrolls in general. We've touched the surface, in my opinion. Um, I think the things that interest me the most about the Elder Scrolls lore is kind of the Daedra and the Aedra. You know, it's, they're yeah. very different. Yeah. And, you know, exploring outside of kind of the regular Tamriel world, that, you know, and going more into that, that ether and, and that magic and mythos is, is, is pretty entertaining, interesting. So you said the, the quarter four for the next um, expansion. Do we have uh, anything more uh, confirmed, I guess? Or yeah, is it, so it, it is... going to be on the consoles and the PC yep. and everything's going to be released on the same, at the same time? We usually do PC about two weeks before consoles, okay. just for certification reasons and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's 15 to 20 hours of new story content. Yeah. Um, there are a bunch of performance improvements in there as well. We've been, you know, since July, uh, I, we announced, you know, kind of a multi um, update plan to kind of improve performance in ESO overall. Okay. So that was in July, and this update is going to have the first bit of that in there, which is um, we reworked how we handled memory in ESO so that. Um, players would um, have a more stable experience so they don't crash as much. Um, performance is improved because memory isn't being thrashed about. You know, we, we optimized how we handled all the memory stuff. So that's the first big bit. The game is huge, obviously. Uh, and uh, each first party, so Sony and Microsoft kind of have their own standards and goals and guidelines. And you have to adhere to both of them. And so, um, that is a challenge. Sometimes those standards are at odds with each other, so we have to work with both of them to kind of make sure that everybody is all good with what we're doing. Um, but it is, yeah, it, it takes about two weeks to go through that certification process. There are, in the MMO space, there are challenges. You know, sometimes there's um, oopsies, if you will, where we have to hotfix something. Um, we can hotfix things on PC much easier than we can hotfix something on a console, change something on a console. Uh, if it's just a server binary, we can kind of do it whenever we want, but if it requires a client change, it has to go through the certification process again, so that takes time. All right, so to finish, I guess new players or uh, people who are checking out the game want to be excited or see what's different in ESO. What can you give them to get them excited? Well, outside of dragons and necromancer and, and cat people, yep. uh, I think the the big differentiator in ESO compared to other games is um, how accessible it is. So back in 2016, we implemented what we called One Tamriel. And this was when we removed uh, a lot of the arbitrary level gates to exploring the world and allowed you to play with anybody, you know, regardless of level. So, you know, it really is an Elder Scrolls experience. You can go anywhere, you can do anything, you can play with anybody and you're never behind. So as, you know, if I'm a max level player and you're a brand new player coming in, we can play together and make meaningful progression. It's really good. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been really, really good talking to you and finding about ESO. Now I want to go back and, and play it, I think, when I get home. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Thank you. G'day, Crinch here with New Game Plus TV and Z Games. I'm at GCAP 2019, day two. A little bit worse for wear, but I'm still here, and I'm here with three beautiful people uh, speaking about Game Workers Unite. We just got out of a talk. Um, first of all, would you mind introducing yourselves and telling me a little bit about uh, your involvement, in involvement with Game Workers Unite? I'm Maze, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm one of the very active Melbourne delegates for Game Workers. Um, I like to cover a lot of the freelancers and indies, and I come from audio myself. Uh, I'm Morgan, I, uh, he, him, I have been involved for about a year with the movement, and I am in a design and technical writing background. Um, I'm Soap. I've been involved with Game Workers Unite for a few months now, but the unionist movement in general for a little bit longer. I've worked with Unions ACT, uh, which is the Trade and Labor Council in um, the ACT. Um, and I also teach game design. So always pushing the GWU to my students. <laughs> so you use the, the sort of wording there, Game Workers Unite movement. Would you mind sort of speaking a little bit to what Game Workers Unite is, um, how it started and where it's at? Game Workers Unite um, started off at a conference called the Game Developers Conference, which is in San Francisco. 
um, where a whole lot of workers crashed a panel about worker rights that was being run by the IGDA. And since then, we've organized online mostly on Discord, uh, all internationally. So that's why it's a bit more of a movement is that in each country, we have to deal with the actual unionization part in really different ways. Is Game Workers Unite only a movement everywhere or has it been able to actually unionize in some territories? Mm. So um, there is a British Game Workers Unite and then in some territories, Game Workers Unite has been working with established unions to create a branch of them, or even just to improve the union's game knowledge. So uh, Game Workers Unite is a movement, especially because of the toxicity that exists around the ideas of game workers and working in games itself. Uh, Things like crunch are just kind of expected parts. Uh, People are expected to do unpaid internships and just expected to be part of the process. It's really a movement because it's not just fighting for people's rights, but also fighting to change people's minds about how they should be treated within the industry. At this talk, what was the general sort of sense? I mean, Morgan, you were one of the speakers up there. What was the general sense in your view of how Australia is responding to the movement? Look, there's a mixed response. I think there's a lot of people that are really interested in being a part of the movement, but there's a lot of hesitation still. A lot of people are, um, I think, still concerned about being seen to be part of a union movement and something we actively have to to work against is the preconceived notions of unions as, you know, bunches of thugs. Um, But it's not. It's a group of workers working together to improve the working rights for themselves and for everyone. Um, One of the the questions that um, came up in the talk earlier was how unions will benefit freelancers and how it will benefit um, a lot of smaller like studios, because the reality is much of the Australian scene is made up of smaller studios. Can you speak a little bit about how the movement may be able to affect positive change uh, in those areas. So as a freelancer myself, um, a huge concern is where we accidentally or deliberately undercut each other. So coming from audio, um, a lot of people don't even know how much they're worth. So things like establishing rate cards and establishing um, template contracts and that sort of thing really helps my field so that I can work from a much higher baseline when I'm negotiating. Um, When it comes to these smaller indies, often what a union can give and what Game Workers Unite has already done is how to run your business ethically as well. Um, So whether that's to go to a more, instead of establishing a company, establishing a co-op instead, um, or just knowing, okay, so if these are all of the worker rights, maybe I should give myself those rights too, you know? Yeah. And you did, a, uh, you did a talk yesterday about co-ops versus companies. Would, what, what are some of the, the brief um, differences that, like, between those two things for people that aren't aware of, of what the difference is? Sure. So a co-op, um, everyone who is a member of the co-op gets one vote. <laughs> and that means that they can talk about what everyone is paid, whether people are paid differently, how profit share is moved and things like that. Um, The other main difference is that with co-ops, you're starting from a point where everyone um, does get equal share of the profit. So in a company, the profit by default default will only go to the directors and the CEOs. And then if you're an employee, you're really trying to ask sweetly, oh, can I have a little bit of revenue share? While a co-op is from the opposite, is all right, we all have the revenue share. Is that fair, like, or should we, you know, take a little bit for the business side or how, now that everyone controls these funds, let's vote how we're going to use them. So in in this talk, uh, it was brought up that the Game Workers Unite movement is there, but also there are already other unions that in some cases have a framework for game workers to exist under. Can you speak a little bit to why that might be valuable to some game workers? Absolutely. So Game Workers Unite is not a registered union. Um, And there are some benefits that registered unions get that something like Game Workers Unite doesn't quite get. They have a lot of laws around it and they can fight for workers' rights in ways that Game Workers Unite can't. Uh, Game Workers Unite is free, which is a benefit, uh, unlike unions. Um, And joining both means that you are organized with your specific field, with Game Workers Unite, but also have a union body to back you up with things in the workplace. If something goes wrong. So I guess if people want to know more about Game Workers Unite, uh, where can they go? Uh, the best place is to visit our website, gameworkers.com.au. They can also jump on our social media. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter. 
uh, they can, through the website, join our Discord, and that's where a lot of our activity takes place. So that's the best bet for finding us. Thank you guys so much for your time. Hey, Crunchyroll at PAX Oz 2019. I'm here with Matt Trobiani. You might know him as the developer of Hacknet and Hacknet Labyrinths, two games I'm yet to play. But uh, you're here with WrestleDunk Sports. Tell me about WrestleDunk Sports, Matt. Cool. So it's real different. It was pretty weird, like going from something so serious to something so goopy. But I'm making sports games. Love my sports. Anyone that knows me, so I'm all about sports and various sporting activities, watching sports playing all sorts of sports. Real human sports. Yeah. Oh wait, there's real human basketball, that's something else. Um, Regular human basketball. I actually, the original name for this game was Normal Human Sports. Yeah. And because I stole <laughs> that name from Power Hoop, which are right over there, yeah. um, because they made Regular Human Basketball, I thought they canned it, so I stole the name from them. And then they stole the name back, and I'm like, I have been robbed. I was so mad. They didn't even know they came to this booth being like, hey, cool game, what's going on? And I'm like, I cannot even believe you would speak to me. And they had no idea, but yeah. You're all about sports, but when people hear of sports games, they're like, oh yeah, I love NBA, I love FIFA. But those aren't the real sports. What are the real sports that you have in this game that people are really, really keen to play? I got wrestling, I got fencing, I got volleyball, and I got Smash Ball. Just the normal sport name for adults. Smash Ball. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I got a bunch of sports. They're all like, they're all like really small games. So, so the deal with this, right? Yeah. You, you're sitting down to watch something on Netflix and there's a show that someone's like, hey, this show's really good. And you know in your heart, you want to watch something that's good. But you're like, hey, I don't want to get involved in that. It's too, much, it's too much work, right? But it's not work. You're just sitting there watching something. There's no work at all. Yep. And then you watch Suits again, like an idiot, right? <laughs> and I'm like- It happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. And I'm like, why? Why is this happening? Like I want to watch shows that are good and yet I watch Suits again. And I'm like, why? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know why. So I was like, I'm gonna work this out. So I reckon the same thing happens with games, right? Like where they're like really good AAA games, but I want to go into like some dumb flash sport site and play slime sports volleyball. I play it's like just two ovals that like bounce and I'll play it for like four hours. And I'll be like, why am I doing this? Like, like I love it, but I'm also, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, so it's playing like flash games, game jam games, games are like really small. I think what's good about them is that they're very like, Pure. The very like hole is in there. Like, there's nothing in there that doesn't need to be there. Because in like 48 hours, you don't have time to make junk that doesn't need to be there, right? And I think the games that result from that are really like, like clean, very tight. They're like, they're like everything in them is necessary, and there's no there's no corrupt. I reckon people go from those sort of games, and when they think about what they need to do to scale up to like a commercial release, they add in a lot of things to try and grow it. They just fluff it. Yeah, so it feels justified in being like, oh, it's like a product, yeah. right? And I think that a lot of the time that ruins it, or it misses like something that's really like essentially entertaining about something that's like so minimalist and tight, it's really good. And I was like, I want to make a bunch of cool games like that. Like I love games like that, and a bunch of things that I make in a game jam are like it. And I leave those game jams being like this game rules, but it will never be able to be released because it's too small. And if I make it bigger, it'll be ruined. So, I made four of them, and I just like put them all together, and it's like a pack. And it's got like a loose sports theme, yeah. but like, that's that's the game. Is it going to be online, or are you wanting to really sort of have it be that single, uh, that, that sorry, local experience? It's online as fuck. It's <laughs> I, like right from day one, we were like planning out the netcode. The netcode's all custom written. The, the tech behind the networking that's gone into it has been like a big part of this project. So like the networking work is really substantial because we wanted to have that local experience. So you can play like half the players are local, half are online, that sort of thing. But have it be good. Right, but have it be like really good. So like if I'm gonna make a whole bunch of little games, right? I think I need to build them on top of the foundation that has like all of the trappings that you want in a really good quality, like, like indie release, right? And then I can like, like if the game does well, just patch in new sports, right? Making the sports is the fun bit, but like having the foundation of like really good netcode, it supports like every controller ever. Like it's got a good lobby system where you can like switch between everything like really seamlessly. And I think like building that foundation let me get away with like doing games that were really like minimal as long as there were a bunch of them. Hacknap was in the Indie Showcase years and years ago. You are now back in the Indie Showcase. How does that feel? I'd say like, 
It's like a jokey interview, but this is actually like, <laughs> this is like a really big thing for me. Okay, so, um, yeah, like when I'm making games, I go like up and down on them a lot. Yeah. And like half the time, I'm like, I'm a big brain genius. And I've made the best video game of all time. No one can stop me. Yeah. And then like, and then a week later, it's like, oh, actually, it was very easy to stop me. And now I feel terrible. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so I'll go on these like big loops of ups and downs of being like, oh, this game's great, this game's terrible. And like, I think uh, like the closer you get to launch or like the more pressure under, the more that cycle like compresses. And like when I was releasing Labyrinth, that was like, it was a matter of hours between thinking I was the smartest and dumbest person in the world. And it, it gets wild, but like, um, yeah, I've been working on other projects as well as this at the same time. And like, I was under a lot of stress, like, um, like during like the, I don't know, like, six months ago ish right and like I, I submitted the game to the showcase when I was on like my big high and I'm like this game rules and then um and I was like I was in the depths of the lowest low when I like like back when I started like working on other projects so I was like this game's gonna die like what am I doing and like it's like it was stressful trying to follow up hack and everything so having that sort of reassurance I imagine yeah, with so like that, that you are that, that you're doing a good job I feel like that makes something of a difference. Right. So like, so like, right when I was at the like the lowest of the low for like for this game, and I was starting to move on to other projects, and I was feeling like it was just gonna die. I like got the call about being in the showcase again, and like a lot of this has just been about like I really want to like I've been like trying to learn a lot as a developer when I was making this, and like I really wanted to just I guess like it didn't need to be commercially successful, but I needed it to be like to feel like you know I can do good things again. And like to get in the showcase again after it was such a big deal for Hackney, and I was so proud of that. It like, it like was so it's such a moment. I was like, it was like such a whiplash and being like, yeah, maybe it'll, maybe it's all gonna be okay. And I'm like trying not to cry. Like it was, um, it was, I think it was like really important for me. And it's like such an honor to be back. Like, I, like I love the showcase. It's, it's such an awesome initiative that Pax does, and like, it's, it's so good to be in a second one. Um, yeah, so it was it was really good. That was actually like a really really important thing for me. Um, so if people want to know more, uh, what is where is Russell Dunk Sports going to be, and when is it going to be released? Uh, it's gonna Roughly, be, it's going to be on Twitter, and it's going to be always there. Um, so just follow me on Twitter. Released on Twitter. Yeah, no, um, yeah. So if you want news about that sort of thing, yep. just follow the game on Twitter. It's at Russell Dunk Game, um, or follow me. Uh, I'm at Oren, and I'll be tweeting about all that sort of thing. Um, it's going to be out on Switch. Uh, that's the only one confirmed. Maybe other platforms. You know, I don't know yet. Um, I don't want to confirm anything. Yeah, without being super sure. Um, and that will probably be aiming for release sometime. You know, December, January. But we might be dodging around AAA stuff, so we might just spend the extra time tweaking it up and release sometime good. Sometime good. Just cut. Whenever. Release. Whenever it works. Yeah, release whenever we're ready. So. It's, uh, we're not sure yet, but, you know, roughly end of this year, start of next year, you know, who knows? That's good. Yeah. Cool. Well, there it is, Russell Long Sports. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for chatting with me about your game and, uh, the whiplash of game development. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks. And that's it for this week on the show. Um, we've got way more coming up. We've always got way more coming up. There's always so much more. It doesn't matter whether you're watching this on uh, TV as New Game Plus or radio as Z Games. Um, we have all the links, Meg. Do you remember all the links? Ah, uh, newgameplus.tv, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Everywhere. Facebook. Slash We're on all the channels. New Game Plus TV. Uh, if you want more podcasting, New Game Plus has a podcast you can find on iTunes and Spotify. Mm -hmm. uh, Z Games is also there. ZEDGamesAU.net is the website. You can mm -hmm. find Z Games AU on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you happen to be in Brisbane, first of all, sorry, uh, but second of all, on Wednesdays Rough. at 6 p.m., uh, you can listen to Z Games on 102.1 FM, Triple Z, uh, on Wednesdays. Yeah. So uh, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, and uh, we'll see you next time.